Well, this week, a friend and colleague of mine, Cliff May, the president of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, who I work with weekly here at PJTV, made an appearance on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Now, Cliff and Mr. Stewart were having a heated argument on the subject of what constitutes torture and what is merely coercion. Here's how the conversation unfolded. In the Here's World War II, we did not inflict pain and suffering I, on, 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 on suspects I, in Ecuador and in Japan. You I think would we hope did? we didn't waterboard people. I would hope that's we why did we did do Hiroshima. I, You're, you, th you, think that you, you think Truman is a war criminal for that? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Okay. Okay, look, this view expressed by John Stewart and shared by millions is becoming ever more widely held the further away from the event we become. Stewart and others maintain that the atomic bombings were criminal acts, claiming that the targeted cities received no warning or that they were of no military value, that the Japanese resistance was crumbling and their use was necessary, and that Japan was trying to surrender at the time of the bombings, which were therefore nothing but an unjustified and brutal signal to merely show the Soviets who's the boss. None of these positions stand up to the facts. We'll come back to the moral issue in a moment. But let's begin with the historical facts. Here's what John Stewart himself had to say about the whole idea of warnings. This is here's, here's what I think on the atom bombs. I think if you dropped an atom bomb 15 miles offshore and you said the next one's coming mm -hmm. and hitting you, then I would think it's okay. To drop one on a city and kill 100,000 people? You yeah. think that would? I, th I think that's criminal. Okay, so Mr. Stewart's main point is that if the Japanese had been warned, quote, then I think it would be okay, unquote. But the Japanese were warned. Because after six minutes of grueling research, I was able to discover this leaflet. This is a photograph of the front side of Office of War Information Notice number 2106, dubbed the LeMay Bombing Leaflet. Over one million of these were dropped over Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and 33 other Japanese cities on the 1st of August, 1945. That's five days before the Hiroshima bombing. The Japanese text on the reverse side of the leaflet carried the following warning, quote, Read this carefully, as it may save your life or the life of a relative or friend. In the next few days, some or all of the cities named on the reverse side will be destroyed by American bombs. These cities contain military installations and workshops and facilities which produce military goods. We are determined to destroy all of the tools of the military clique, which they are using to prolong this useless war. But, unfortunately, bombs have no eyes. So, in accordance with America's humanitarian policies, the American Air Force, which does not wish to injure your innocent people now gives you warning to evacuate the cities named and save your lives. America is not fighting the Japanese people, but it is fighting the military clique which has enslaved the Japanese people. The peace which America will bring will free the people from the oppression of the military clique and mean the emergence of a new and better Japan. You can restore peace by demanding new and good leaders who will end the war. We cannot promise that only these cities will be among those attacked, but some or all of them will be, so heed these warnings and evacuate these these cities immediately. Now that's certainly more warning than our sailors got on the morning of December 7th, 1941, but was it enough? Well, John Stewart suggests that the appropriate thing to do would have been to drop the first bomb out at sea as a demonstration. Well, now let's follow Mr. Stewart's line of reasoning here. The effort to develop the atomic bomb was codenamed the Manhattan Project, and it was spectacularly expensive. To give you some idea of the scale of it, the small town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where the fissionable materials were produced, consumed one-sixth of all of the electricity generated in the entire United States. The Manhattan Project alone likely used more electricity than was generated in the entire nation of Japan. After many years, this mighty effort produced four bombs, four of them. The world's first nuclear weapon, a plutonium device codenamed Gadget, was detonated over the United States of America just before 5.30 a.m. on July 16, 1945 at White Sands, New Mexico, in a test firing called Trinity. The Trinity bomb was extremely delicate and its reliability very much in question. It used an exquisitely timed series of conventional explosives to implode a plutonium core and reach criticality. Now, bomb number three, called Fat Man, was of exactly this type, as I believe was the unnamed and unused bomb number four. So the Manhattan Project scientists essentially wasted 25% of the total arsenal, that's the gadget bomb, in the Trinity test in order to be certain that bombs number three and number four would actually work. The second bomb was called Little Boy. It was a uranium bullet type bomb, less efficient, but judged reliable enough so that it didn't need testing. So now let's pick up John Stewart's suggestion. We bet the entire farm, all of our best scientists, almost 30 billion of today's dollars for the bombs and almost that much again for the B-29s to carry them. And we've already detonated 25% of the results of that Manhattan Project on a test. 
Look, we dropped millions of warning leaflets in the days before the attacks, but John Stewart says he would only be satisfied if we had demonstrated the weapon. So, presumably, we send a message to the Imperial High Command that says, hey guys, how's it going? Listen, we've got this super weapon that we've been working on for two years, and even though you've killed hundreds of thousands of our sons and fathers ever since you sneak attacked us without warning back at Pearl Harbor, we wanted to show you what it can do. So, next Sunday morning, set up some lawn chairs looking out over the ocean, we'll tell you exactly where, and then right at noon precisely, we'll send one of these bombers out there to drop one of these wonder weapons. But no fair trying to shoot it down just because you know exactly where and when and what to look for. Because when you see the kind of splash this thing makes, well, either you're going to give up on the spot or you'll suddenly somehow deserve what's coming to you when you wouldn't have deserved it otherwise if we hadn't dropped one out in the bay. If all of this is a little morally confusing, don't worry. Some snarky narcissistic comedian will explain how that works for you 64 years from now. But look, the whole point is moot, and John Stewart knows it's moot. We know for a fact that dropping an atomic bomb 15 miles out to sea would not have caused the Japanese to surrender in order to avoid that fate. How do we know? Because we dropped one on an actual city, and they still did not surrender. And nor were they about to, contrary to what many would have you believe. As the United States Navy and Marines approached the Japanese mainland, resistance and casualties increased, not decreased. Look, in six grinding months from August of 1942 to February of 1943, the Allies lost about 1,500 men killed at Guadalcanal. The first battle on Japanese soil, an uninhabited little speck called Iwo Jima, killed 7,000 men, not in six months, but in five brutal weeks. Four days after the official end of the carnage on Iwo, Americans went ashore in Okinawa, even closer to the sacred soil of homeland Japan, and in 82 days, almost 13,000 Allied soldiers were killed. The United States Navy lost 34 ships, many of them to these new kamikaze attacks, which caused the United States Navy to lose more men in that one engagement, Okinawa, than in all of America's previous wars combined. Japanese resistance was not fading. It was becoming ever more fanatical. After Okinawa and before the atomic bombings, the father of the kamikaze attacks, Admiral Takajiro Onishi, declared, quote, if we are prepared to sacrifice 20 million lives in kamikaze effort, victory will be ours. 20 million people is 100 times the number killed in the atomic attacks. This isn't an assertion, and it isn't speculation. These are the words directly from the military clique that ruled Imperial Japan. The Japanese battle plan was called Ketsugo. It translates roughly as decisive operation. On June 8, 1945, a little less than one month before the first atomic bomb was dropped, Emperor Hirohito declared Ketsugo would be, quote, the fundamental policy to be followed henceforth in the conduct of the war, unquote. It proclaimed that, quote, Japan must fight to the finish and choose extinction rather than surrender, unquote. Again, we're not talking about the assertions of a comedy show host. We're talking about official policy statements from the god emperor of Japan. Special attack weapons were being sanctioned, including additional kamikaze air and submarine attacks. Children, children were being trained to carry backpacks of explosives and throw themselves under American tanks. Admiral Onishi went on to say that 32 million civilians were being trained in the use of primitive weapons, that would be bamboo spears to you and me, in order to make a heroic last stand. Now, opposing Ketsugo was the American plan for the evasion of the Japanese home islands, Operation Downfall. Phase one of Operation Downfall was called Operation Olympic. It would be the amphibious assault on the southern island of Kyushu with over 767,000 American troops, more than four times as many as were used in the D-Day invasion of Normandy in Europe. The core of the Japanese defense against Operation Olympic would come from the Imperial Army troops stationed in position to defend Kyushu. That army of 43,000 men was crowded in with various military installations, manufacturing facilities, and 280,000 civilians at the Army headquarters located in the heart of a modest city named Hiroshima. The bomb detonated directly over that army's parade grounds. Hiroshima was not, as some will tell you, a purely civilian target. Like all Japanese manufacturing centers, the munitions factories, the weapons depots, troops barracks, other military targets, all of this was dispersed among the civilian population. Now, at 8.16 a.m. on the morning of August 6, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay dropped bomb number two, Little Boy, which exploded with the force of about 15,000 tons of TNT. Now, we've all grown up under the shadow of hydrogen weapons, H-bombs, but these are thousands of times more powerful than the fission bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. If you detonated the little boy Hiroshima bomb in the center of Los Angeles Airport, the fatal blast radius remains inside the airport boundary. 
but it did produce horrific damage to these wooden paper structures. 70,000 people were killed almost instantly, and perhaps another 70,000 would later succumb to burns, injuries, and radiation. But the Japanese did not surrender. August 7th passed with no word from the Imperial High Command, as did August 8th. Meanwhile, American B-29s continued their firebombing of Japanese targets. And then on the morning of August 9th, another B-29 boxcar took off with Fat Man Bomb No. 3, a higher yield, less reliable plutonium bomb like Gadget. The Japanese city of Kokura was the primary target, but clouds obscured that city, so boxcar diverted to the secondary, which was Nagasaki. It too was overcast, but a brief hole in the cloud cover was enough to give the bombardier an aim point. Fat Man exploded with a force equal to about 22,000 tons of TNT, about half again that of Little Boy, detonating precisely halfway between the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works, a munitions plant, and the Mitsubishi Urakami Ordnance Works, which manufactured torpedoes for the Imperial Japanese Navy. Total deaths at Nagasaki were lower, about 80,000 people would die from immediate or long-term effects, and still the Japanese did not surrender, and still the conventional bombings continued. August 9th passed, August 10th, August 11th, the fourth bomb was being readied, and it started to appear that the Air Force would have to begin conserving atomic bombs for use during the invasion. You see, even after the second bomb was dropped, Emperor Hirohito was hearing from his advisors that Japan still had 32 million people prepared to give their lives for their emperor. With luck, we will repel the invaders before they land, said General Yoshihiro Umesu, with the ruins of Hiroshima and Nagasaki still smoldering across their country. Japan would have eventually surrendered without the atomic bombs. Yeah, it might have taken an invasion with perhaps a million American soldiers killed or wounded, and three or five or seven or 20 million Japanese civilians as well. A post-war American bombing survey concluded that Japan probably would have capitulated by November or December prior to an invasion, but that was only because the fire bombings would have continued for another three months or four or six. You know, before the atomic bombings, 40% of the much, much larger city of Tokyo had been flattened as effectively as ground zero at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Kobe, the size of Baltimore, had been about 55% scoured, that is, wiped clean off the map by conventional bombs. Osaka, with a population equal to Chicago, let's say, had about 35% of its structures destroyed. Almost 60% of Yokohama, about the size of Cleveland, had gone up in flames in conventional bombing raids. None of this devastation had brought Japan to its knees, but the atomic bombs did. On August 12th, three days after Nagasaki, Hirohito was asked by a relative if the war should continue, if surrender meant the loss of the imperial family and their social structure. Of course, he replied. August 13th then passed, and finally, on August 14th, the emperor relented, and as he was traveling to the radio station to announce the surrender of his empire, he narrowly escaped kidnapping by imperial Japanese officers determined not to let even the god king end this war, but he did end it, and when he finally ended it, he said why he ended it. The enemy now possesses a new and terrible weapon with the power to destroy many innocent lives and do incalculable damage. Should we continue to fight, not only would it result in an ultimate collapse and obliteration of the Japanese nation, but also it would lead to the total extinction of human civilization. This is the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the provisions of the Joint Declaration of the Powers. Japanese pilot Mitsuo Fushida led the air attack against Pearl Harbor. This is not a pacifist. After the war, he told Paul Tibbets, the pilot of the Enola Gate, quote, you did the right thing. You know the Japanese attitude at that time, how fanatic they were. They'd die for the emperor. Every man, woman, and child would have resisted the invasion with sticks and stones if necessary, unquote. The use of the American atomic bombs saved, at minimum, hundreds of thousands of Japanese lives from the continued conventional bombing. If the invasion had been necessary, and no one at that time had any reason to think it would not be necessary, given the pattern of increasing resistance, then millions more Japanese would die holding bamboo spears and wearing explosive backpacks. Hundreds of thousands of American soldiers would have been killed, perhaps including this one. Now, I got to know this man over the course of my life. He was just a regular Army second lieutenant who got to Germany just as the war there was ending. He and all of his friends knew where they were headed next. And having watched the Marines fight and die for every inch of sand that they took, they frankly did not think that they were going to come home. 
When word came of the Japanese surrender as a result of the atomic bombs, these men were stunned. The Marines were stunned. Navy pilots, tough, battle-hardened men who had seen horror that John Stewart and I will never be able to imagine thanks to them, those men burst into tears at the news. They were bursting into tears because they knew they had a chance to live. They were going to go home because of that decision that Harry Truman had made that day. This man would go home and he would marry this woman. They'd have four children, and some of those children would have children. The oldest one would play a little league baseball, and he'd go to high school and make some movies. And finally, that little boy would be sitting in this chair because Harry Truman gave his father a chance to come home. John Stewart wants to call Harry Truman a war criminal? If Harry Truman is a war criminal for the atomic bombings, then Roosevelt is one for the fire bombings of Tokyo and Dresden. And if Roosevelt is a war criminal for causing the fiery deaths of civilians, then Abraham Lincoln, whose Union armies burned Atlanta and Columbia to the ground in order to end that war, well, he must be one too. And if by the snowy standards of these liberals' Olympian intellect and morality, if Harry Truman is essentially the same creature as Adolf Hitler, both war criminals, then these people the actual victims of real war criminals, well, they become just a little bit less to worry about, don't they? Mr. Stewart, you do not exist on some superior intellectual plane, and you most certainly do not exist on a superior moral one. You can slander the men who have given you a life where your toughest decision is what you're going to have your assistant get you for lunch. But those people who came home as a result of Harry Truman's courage deserve a hell of a lot better than to be told that their lives are worth less than your moral discomfort, and the de facto voice of a generation should not be someone quite as self-centered as you.